Life of Jesus, a devotional study by Melva Perkis. Forward. Writers of biographies usually find that they are helped by the shadows cast by their subjects rather than by any nobility of character radiating from them. Weaknesses reveal more than excellences. So many apparent virtues are counterfeits. But Jesus casts no shadows. He stands irradiated by the light of heaven, beloved of God. Those who abide with him glow in his light, and even the wrath of his enemies is transmuted into the glory of love when it falls upon him. He is altogether lovely. It is impossible to write a biography of Jesus for another reason. We become conscious as we write that we are not approaching a subject but a living person. And as our pen writes of his earthly life, we become more and more aware that we are writing in his presence, and then become convinced that his life should be written upon our knees and exercised in our lives. My purpose has been to present a simple picture of Jesus, so that the reader may be encouraged to look even more reverently at the man who can be confused with no other man, and meditate more frequently upon the words that could have fallen from no other lips. To undertake so much is to feel a sense of presumption, which is only tempered by the knowledge that God's strength is made perfect in weakness. And he is sometimes pleased to make use of an imperfect vessel to further his eternal purposes. One or two observations seem necessary in introducing this work to its readers. It is essentially a devotional and not a theological book. It is designed to help in the work of feeding the flock, rather than in the equally necessary task of casting forth the nets. It may not do much towards clarifying the understanding, but it is our prayer that it may help to warm the heart. This self-imposed limitation has meant that some important and interesting matters have been passed over without critical examination. Points such as the date of Christ's birth, the historicity of Luke, the genealogies of Matthew and Luke, the use of prophecy in Matthew's Gospel, have not been discussed. Abundant evidence awaits the student on these subjects, and to have paused to examine them would have clouded the purpose for which this book was written. The chronology of the Gospels is not an easy problem to resolve, and in this I have been generally guided by the order of events in Mark. Where it was not possible to follow that Gospel, I have in the majority of cases yielded to the reasoning of Samuel Andrews in his Bible Student's Life of Our Lord. The parables recorded in the Gospels have been fully dealt with by Brother John Carter in Parables of the Messiah. The discourses of Jesus recorded by John in the same writers, the Gospel of John. These two subjects have therefore been only cursorily covered here. It is an arrangement not altogether without advantage, since it allows a greater emphasis upon the life of Jesus, as distinct from his teaching. Our knowledge of Jesus in its deepest sense can never be something we read about him in a book, or even in the Gospels themselves. It must always be a sacred communion with him in the sanctuary of our own devoted hearts. It is with earnest prayer that it will help us to love and serve him that we dedicate this humble work to him. Prologue 
The redemption of the world by Jesus of Nazareth is the entrance of the eternal purpose of God into this temporal sphere where man lives his human life, records his history and returns to his dust. For the 33 years that purpose was worked out day by day in the life of one who lived in a small country on the outposts of the Roman Empire and died on a plot of ground outside the walls of Jerusalem when Pontius Pilate was procurator of Judea. History shows us a garden tomb, a military guard, frightened disciples and anxious rulers. With this background there was wrought out the eternal purpose of redemption. We see nothing of that outworking. We see only its evidence in an earthquake, a stone rolled away, an empty sepulchre. That is history. Forty days later on the Mount of Olives, we see a band of disciples looking steadfastly into the heavens. That is history. As a cloud receives their Lord out of their sight, history merges into eternity. It is in this setting that the pages which follow find their true perspective. With that said, or rather read, let us commence the book itself. So, Book 1, The Fullness of Time, Chapter 1, The Birth of Jesus. Joseph and Mary were nearing the end of their long journey to Bethlehem. It seemed to Mary more than a few short months since the angel Gabriel had come to her with his breathtaking message. She still could scarcely believe that the fullness of time had come and God was about to fulfil the promise he had made through the prophets to send the Messiah to redeem Israel and bring salvation to the ends of the earth. As the time drew nearer, she had felt again and again a surge of wonder that she should have found favour with God, that she was destined to be the virgin through whom God's purpose was to be revealed. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, she had said, as she had looked into the face of her heavenly visitor. Be it unto me according to thy word. Gabriel had departed, leaving her alone with tumultuous thoughts. The life of Nazareth had gone on as usual. Nothing seemed to have changed to disturb its normal course. Yet Mary knew that nothing would ever be the same again. For the first time she had understood the literal significance of the message of the Lord to Ahaz nearly 800 years before. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. With the growing realisation of the honour and responsibility had come an intense desire to place herself unreservedly in the hand of God, to live in his presence in a state of constant prayer, it had also awakened a natural desire to confide in some understanding heart. But to whom could she go? She had been far too wise to share her dread and glorious secret with any ordinary acquaintance. A sweet modesty and apprehension had sealed her lips when she met Joseph. There was only one to whom she could go. Elizabeth, her elderly cousin, was intimately associated with the angel's message. She was rejoicing in the prospect of bearing a promised son long after she had given up all hope of motherhood. So Mary had ha departed hastily to the hill country of Judea, and there, in affectionate companionship, preparations had been made for the birth of the messenger and the saviour. The atmosphere of love and reverence in which these months had been passed can be sensed from the salutation of Elizabeth and the responsive cry of Mary. 
There had been months of joy and exultation, and the spirit of both women was a perfect preparation for the lives that were about to be manifested. Mary had returned to Nazareth before John was born. She was no longer the simple, carefree, Israelitish maiden. The events of the past months had brought her to womanhood. The long hours of exalted communion had strengthened her for the trials and bitterness that lay before her. Indeed, a severe trial had awaited her at Nazareth, for her condition could no longer be concealed. The innuendos, the whisperings, and the subtle persecutions of her neighbours could be endured, but with what horror she had watched the doubt and pain clearly discerned on Joseph's honest face. Torn between a sense of honour which could not contemplate further association, and a love which would not expose her to public disgrace, he had finally decided to put her from him privately when the solution had come from the only possible source. His troubled sleep had been invaded by a heavenly visitor. Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. The divine message would do more than restore harmony and love. It would call forth a profound reverence from Joseph and bring out all his manly instincts to help and protect her in the difficult days ahead. The decree of Caesar Augustus that the census should be taken in Israel with a view to future taxation had set the whole country in motion. The decree required that everyone should go to his ancestral home for registration. Thus Joseph and Mary were faced with a long and perilous journey at a critical time. Mary would almost certainly know, as the scribes knew, that Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. This prophecy of Micah may well have bewildered her and even taxed her faith until one day the news was brought of the necessity to go to Bethlehem at the precise time that she should give birth to her son. In that event her journey would be in conscious obedience to the will of God. The longer journey south was slow and arduous. Mary was conscious of the nearness of the great event which had occupied her thoughts and prayers constantly during the past months. Joseph, looking frequently and searchingly into her tired, brave face, would view the domes of Bethlehem with unconcealed relief and quicken the pace of the donkey to climb the hill upon which it stood. But a disappointment awaited them. Many travellers whose progress had been faster and whose journey had been shorter had come to register in the city of David. With growing consternation, Joseph would watch the jostling crowds in the narrow streets. There was no room in the inn. It was a dark symbol of the advent of Messiah who came to his own and his own received him not. Although Mary's condition must have been obvious to many residents in Bethlehem, no friendly home opened its doors to receive her, and there was no motherly arm to minister to her need. At last Mary sank down exhausted in the store of the stable, with Joseph watching anxiously over her as the shadows grew deeper. There is a footnote here which reads, there would be only one large room at the inn. Approximately half of this was raised a foot or more to provide a sleeping space for the guests, while the lower half formed the stable for their beasts. The manger was hollowed out along the top edge of the raised pot. There, in the darkness of the night, a tiny cry mingled with the noises of the asses and the camels. In the city in which God had chosen to anoint David king of Israel, 
David's greater son was born. There can be no more conclusive evidence than this, that God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and the base things of the world, and the things which are despised, to bring to naught the things that are. The advent of the Son of God to bring light and life to a dark and perishing world, heralded by God's prophets, foreshadowed by his law, was the most momentous event in the earth's history. Human ingenuity would have been baffled by the task of preparing a fitting occasion for introducing him to the children of men. The everlasting Father takes us infinitely wandering to a rude stable and to a simple, pure Israelitish maid lying among the animals with a bundle of life clasped to her breast. Learning the lesson of the stable, we progress far in our knowledge of the ways of God and cry with the Apostle Paul, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. As God chose the base things, so he chose the poor of this world, rich in faith, to receive the glad tidings of salvation. The angel passed over the city of Jerusalem. There Herod and his courtly nobles held their drunken carousals, and there the religious rulers of the Jews were preoccupied with secular ambitions. The glory of his presence lit up the hills of Bethlehem, where David had tended the flocks and learned confidence in God. Watching shepherds fell back in fear until strong, clear words had reassured them. No angel of judgment stood before them. Fear not. I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, which is Messiah the Lord. Suddenly the heavens were filled with the exultant throng of angels, ascribing glory to the God of heaven and acclaiming the deliverance he had brought to the earth. Though naturally slow and silent men, the shepherds immediately left their flocks and came with haste to find and worship the newborn Saviour. They returned glorifying the God of Israel and praising his name. Next morning the sun rose over the hills of Moab, bringing another day. The people of Bethlehem busied themselves with their daily tasks. The registration continued, little bands of travellers left the town for their homes, oblivious of the events of the most momentous night the world had known. Eight days passed. And then the babe was circumcised according to the Jewish law and received the name the angel had pronounced before his birth. Jesus was a name which already had an illustrious significance in Israel. In its Hebrew form, Joshua, it described one who had continued the work of Moses and by a series of remarkable conquests, had brought the children of God into the land of promise. It is a name which means, Jehovah is salvation, and was destined to become sacred far beyond the confines of Palestine, and a few thousands of men and women who saw him for a short period of years. Christ, the Messiah, is his title as the anointed of God. Jesus is the personal name of him who loved us and gave himself for us. To us he is precious when we dedicate ourselves to his service in baptism, and with the passing years he becomes more precious. In our own bitter struggle against environment and temperament, we learn the greatness of his conquests and feel the need for his presence, 
We are conscious of the fellowship of his sufferings in our victories and the strength of his inspiration in our defeats. Our knowledge of him is no longer confined to the revelation of Scripture. He becomes a living reality in our lives, leading us to realize in ourselves that he ever liveth and maketh intercession for us. The records of Matthew and Luke do not linger upon the incidents which describe the birth of our Saviour. They quickly pass to the development of his character and his work. But it is well that our minds return to a contemplation of this lowly scene, because it is there in this stable sanctuary that we are face to face with the love of God. Later it is to be more fully revealed to us in the strong and compelling power of his Son's dedication. But here, in the angelic visitations and the quietly developing events which reach their fulfilment in the inn yard at Bethlehem, we have the full impact of the great fact that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have everlasting life. In our struggles towards full stature in his Son, we are sometimes all but discouraged by the very strength of Christ's dedication and the completeness of his active submission to his Father's will. It is at such times that we can come quietly into the moonlit courtyard and looking upon the sleeping babe, receive into our innermost being the deep comfort of our Heavenly Father's abiding love.